This morning on Wake Up With Hope, we have an inspiring message from Roy Ice from Faith For Today, Dr. Narita McKibben from Go Healthy For Good, sharing insightful health tips on sleep. And a little talk on life's greatest privilege. Don't go away. Good morning. It's a bright new morning here at Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for waking up with us today. We're excited to be here and happy for another yes, day are. of life. How's your day going this wintry morning? What's the weather like where you are? Well, write to us on Facebook and let us know where you're at and what your weather's like today. We'd love to hear from you. That's right. On today's program, we will have Roy Ice from Faith For Today sharing a relevant message from the Bible with us and Dr. Narada McKibben from Go Healthy For Good will also be here to share some good motivators for sleep. And we have a special feature on life's greatest privilege. But first, this day in history. Napoleon Bonaparte was the first Frenchman to hold the title of emperor in a thousand years in the Notre Dame Cathedral of Paris. On this day in history in 1804, Pope Pius VII crowned the 35-year-old conqueror of Europe as emperor. Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists ever. He rose in history in the military ranks of the French Revolutionary Army during the late 1790s. In 1799, Napoleon returned from an Egyptian campaign and took over the reins of the French government, thus saving his nation from collapsing. Napoleon Bonaparte played an essential role in reorganizing the French armies, instituting a new system of French law, and ultimately establishing the French Empire. However, by the year 1815, he had suffered significant defeats in his military career and was exiled to the island of St. Helena off the coast of Africa. He lived there with a few of his followers under house arrest until May 1821, where he died at the young age of 51 years old due to stomach cancer. Napoleon Bonaparte's life and contributions were eventually commemorated with a magnificent funeral in Paris in 1840. You know, friends, this reminds me of when Jesus came to this earth. In the Bible, we find that Jesus was beaten, mocked, spit upon, and cursed. Finally, his despisers hated him so much that they killed the one who had come to save them. Though it was a tragedy and his followers wept and sorrowed, it was a prophecy that had to be fulfilled. You see, Jesus knew that he was going to be hated and crucified. But you know what, friends? After Jesus died on the cross, a wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea asked the government leaders for the body of Jesus. And once he received it, he laid Jesus in a tomb that was fit for a king. Historical records tell us that the tomb that Jesus was buried in was not a regular tomb, nor was it the tomb of a poor man. See, God the Father had made provision for the King of Heaven to be buried as the King of Heaven. What an amazing fact that one day soon He promises to come back to receive His followers and take them home to be with Him in Heaven. And when he comes back, he will come as the King of kings and Lord of lords, full of glory and majesty. Oh, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait. I can't wait for that day either. Are you married or thinking about marriage? Marriage is a wonderful gift given to us by the Creator Himself. But do we tend to take it for granted? Well, this morning, Adrian Webster shares how marriage is actually one of life's greatest privileges. One in three women are going to experience some form of psychological or physical abuse at the hands of their partner throughout their lifetime. Even more frightening than that is that 14 women, 6 men and 10 children are going to die as a result of an incident of domestic violence. And then there are our police force. They're called to 200 incidents of domestic violence a day. That's one every 7 minutes. And the most frightening of all Get this, the police estimate that only 18% of domestic violence incidents are actually reported. If you're one of
one of those people that have the privilege of enjoying a marriage that is completely contented, completely fulfilled, uh, free of any sort of violence or abuse, cherish it, relish it, and count your blessings because many are not in that privileged position. There's an interesting uh, example in scripture in, in the Bible that's just, it captures my imagination because it's the idea that Jesus so loved his church that he laid down his life to spare her, to save her, to restore her. You know, it's like the picture of what love really is, the willingness to forget oneself in order to reach out to the other. And I think to myself, isn't that what marriage is supposed to be like? Isn't that in fact the epitome, the ideal for a healthy, happy, flourishing marriage? That's in fact what that scripture says. It, it asks husbands to love their wives in that kind of self-sacrificing way, which is totally countercultural when you think about it because everything in our culture and our society is about the me generation, about how I can obtain greatest fulfillment and enjoyment and pleasure and the like. Our culture is that men are strong and men take and men do. And actually scripture comes along and says, you want a marriage that works? You want a marriage that thrives? You want a marriage where people are happy, contented and fulfilled? It's going to look different. It's going to be where a man is a man based on his willingness to lay down his life, to bless, to serve, to nurture, to protect, to save. What would our marriages look like if this was the estimate of manhood that we strove to attain to? What would our, how would our marriages and our homes be different? Because I'm thinking there'd be less abuse, I'm thinking there would be less selfishness. I'm thinking there would be greater contentment, fulfillment. I'm thinking our women, our wives would, would feel protected and nurtured, that they may even begin to come into their own and to blossom. I'm thinking that marriages could be very different, that our families here in New Zealand would be profoundly positively impacted by men who step forward and say, no more using my strength for me but I'm going to use my strength to love, to lay down my life, to sacrifice for my wife, for my children, for my family. That's the picture of Jesus. That's what families are supposed to be just a small taste of experientially. What a different picture. So what about you today? What do you say? Are you willing to give this new picture a go in your family? I'd have to agree with him, honey. Marriage is a wonderful <laughs> gift from God. Yes, it is. Well, friends, we have more in store for you today, but we have to take a quick break. When we return, Go Healthy for Good has an invigorating health segment for us. Then Roy Ice from Faith for Today will be sharing a devotional blessing with us as well. But first, we have doctor's orders. <laughs> Oh no, gasoline has gone up again. Again? This will work. Hey, what are you doing putting water in the car? Well, you were saying that gasoline's so expensive, mm -hmm. and I agree. And so I just thought, you know, it's, it's free at the station. We can just use water. Well, that will never work. It's not flammable. It'll kill the engine. It just won't work. I'm sorry. Oh, well, okay. Well, then we'll press the diesel button. Diesel? That but, won't work either. But it's cheaper. Yeah. And it runs trucks, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's flammable. Yeah. Well, if it runs a big old truck, surely it'll run a little old car like mine. Yeah, but this car was designed to run on gasoline, not diesel, not water. It'll never work. Oh, well that's exactly my point. This is what we were designed to run on. This is the right fuel, but many people think that they can run their bodies on this fuel. And this kind of fuel clogs up our bodies just like the wrong fuel clogs up our cars. And the thing about this fuel is, it's not just an engine that we're clogging up, which can be replaced. Clog our bodies, causing pain, suffering, and premature death. And not only that, this fuel tastes a lot better than that fuel. Well, I better put this where it belongs. You better. Now, eat the right fuel. Doctor's orders. 
a link to that. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for spending this time with us this morning. As promised, we have a special health tip from our friend, Dr. Nerida McKibben from Go Healthy For Good. Dr. McKibben is a New Zealand born doctor with her own practice and program here on Hope Channel called Go Healthy For Good. She loves helping others and incorporating holistic health principles into her practice. This morning, Dr. McKibben will be sharing health information on something many of us have trouble with, sleep. Dr. McKibben? How much sleep should we actually get? Well, the National Sleep Foundation made the following recommendations for the number of hours of sleep we need based on our age. For newborns less than three months old, it's 14 to 17 hours. For infants four months to a year old, 12 to 15 hours. For toddlers, 11 to 14 hours. Preschoolers, 10 to 13 hours. By the time you get to school, you're down to nine to 11 hours. And teenagers still need more than adults at eight to 10 hours. Adults, seven to nine hours. And older adults over 65, you actually need almost as much sleep, seven to eight hours. And if we don't get enough, we get grumpy and emotional. It affects our relationships. And then if we actually look at the brain, there's a 60 to 80% drop in the blood flow to the frontal lobe and the thalamus. Now that sets us up for depression, poor decision making, and cognitive impairment. We actually can't concentrate very well. We become clumsy. We don't see danger when it's there, and we make mistakes. Mistakes like Three Mile Island nuclear accident, Chernobyl, and the Challenger disaster, they were all related in some way to sleep deprivation. And did you know that alcohol and sleep deprivation vie for top killers on our roads. You know, when, when we're sleep deprived, we struggle to learn new skills, we forget things, and we lack motivation. We really don't wanna do anything. We lose our joy and our zest for life. That makes us really boring friends and family members. Our immune system also becomes impaired. We're more prone to infections, they last longer. We also get an increase in lung disease, in heart disease, and hypertension, diabetes, and a lot of chronic disease. And when we significantly cut sleep, the body makes an overabundance of stress chemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol. And each hour that we are short of our recommended sleep will increase the body weight by three quarters of a pound. There are two hormones in the brain, leptin and ghrelin, and they control our feelings of hunger and fullness. And so when we lack sleep, these hormones are affected and we snack more, we have more food cravings, we just can't satisfy our appetite, especially at night, and we crave junk food. So it's not the carrots that we sneak into the fridge for, it's more likely to be the carrot cake. So try to schedule more time for sleep. And if you just can't sleep, here are some tips. The body makes a substance called adenosine. The more adenosine we have, the more time our brain spends in deep sleep. So how do we stimulate more production of adenosine? Exercise. But there's something that kills adenosine and that we need to cut out, and that's caffeine. Caffeine-containing compounds, coffee, tea, some herbal teas even, sodas, energy drinks, and even chocolate contain caffeine. So you need to eliminate these things if you're having trouble sleeping. And while we're on the subject of drinks, there's one drink to bear in mind, alcohol. One drink of alcohol will disrupt sleep for two hours. It suppresses our dream sleep, increases snoring and sleep apnea, and it makes the brain fidgety at a time when it's actually really important for the brain to be very organized during sleep. Exercising to tolerance, where we've got your heart racing, you're breathing hard, that will increase the production of a natural tranquilizer called delta-induced polypeptide. So if you haven't had a good workout, even just a brief one today, then you're not gonna sleep as well as if you had done that. Now the other thing to bear in mind is exposure to daylight, especially in the morning. That's gonna help us sleep that night. And then cutting light near bedtime will boost the melatonin production and that is gonna help us 
get a good night of sleep. So all of these little things add up to either a poor night of sleep or a great night of sleep. Thank you, Doc. We all need our sleep. <laughs> well, now we have to take a short break, but stay with us. After the break, we will have today's devotional thought by Roy Ice from Faith for Today. Don't go anywhere. Wake up with hope. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for staying with us. And now it's time for our devotional thought. This morning it will be brought to us by Faith For Today's Roy Ice. Slava Rostopovich is a world famous cello player. Since his exile from his native Russia in 1974, he lived in the West. He's considered by many to have been the greatest cello player of the second half of the 20th century and one of the greatest of all time. When the Kremlin hardliners pulled their August coup, Slava was in Paris. Instead of scurrying back to the U.S. in safety, he and his family flew straight home to Moscow. There, he took up his place in the Russian Federation building that President Boris Yeltsin and his elected allies vowed to hold against every assault. In the darkened corridors, someone gave him a Kalashnikov automatic rifle but he returned it. Rather, he took out his cello and gave an impromptu recital to break the awful tension of the siege. Nearly 3,000 years earlier, in 856 BC, music was heard in the midst of another battle. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, more than anything, wanted to do what God commanded. God honored him for that commitment and made him great. But even during times of greatness, crises still come into our lives. This crisis was a surprise attack from the Southeast. Three nations suddenly moved against Judah, Moab, Ammon, and the Mayonites. Without warning, they crossed the Dead Sea. Even now, they were only 40 miles away. The danger was very real. Another day or two or three, and the enemy would be at the gates of Jerusalem. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 2, adds a significant phrase. A vast army is coming against you. That made it very personal. Not just against Judah, not just against Jerusalem, but against the king himself, against Jehoshaphat. This was a true test of one man's faith in the time of crisis. What will he do? You know, a man may do many things in a time of crisis. Some cover up, some give up, others panic, still others deny they have a problem at all. But verse three reveals this key response. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Everything turns on that fact. This was the decisive moment. It's not the crisis that destroys men. It's what we do or don't do when the crisis hits. What do you do when the land is invaded around you? Get the guns, call the army? That would make sense because Judah had a large, well-trained army, but not this time. Jehoshaphat did something that by human standards makes no sense. He called a nationwide fast and asked the people to join him in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. Now that's crazy by all human standards. Common sense says, don't waste time. There's a time to pray and a time to fight, but now's the time to fight. Oh no, says Jehoshaphat, now is the time to pray. His prayer, recorded in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6 through 12, stands as one of the greatest prayers in all of the Bible. In his prayer, there's only one request. Will you not judge them? Verse 12. There is only one complaint. See how they've repaid us? Verse 11. And there is only one confession. We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Verse 12. This isn't a very long prayer, but it saved an entire nation. It wasn't very complicated, but it got the job done. The answer wasn't long in coming. While the people were gathered in Jerusalem, the Lord spoke through a prophet named Jehaziel. His message was simple. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. 
for the battle is not yours, but God's. Take a moment to savor that last phrase. The battle's not yours, but the Lord's. Now we get to the good part of the story. The next morning, the army of Judah begins to move against the enemy. But it's the strangest battle formation in history. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, people of Judah and Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Can you imagine the sight? Here comes the army of Judah, thousands of men armed for battle. Who's at the head? Not the scouts, not the archers, not the warriors, not the infantry, not the mighty men. The choir is leading the way. This was a bold, audacious move. Either the singers will be killed in a great slaughter or God will come through. But this is God's battle. So the proper response is bold, audacious worship. They say that an eerie silence envelops the battlefield just before the first shot is fired. A tense, living silence when all the world stops just before the roar of the guns. In that silent moment, men gather their thoughts, say their private prayers, and prepare to die. Military strategists tell us that nothing is more important in battle than achieving the element of surprise. If your enemy doesn't know you're coming, Perhaps the shock of the first assault will win the day. If you can hit him when he doesn't expect it, he will rock back on his heels and soon flee the field. But the army of Judah gave up the element of surprise. Here they come down the road, led by the male chorus, singing at the top of their voices. Not a patriotic hymn, not a love song, not a military march, but a cry of praise to the Almighty God. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. Over and over they sang, lifting their praise higher and higher. No doubt the soldiers joined them, thundering the sound of praise across the arid hills toward En Gedi. This strategy would appear to be suicidal. In the first place, they were giving up all hope of surprise. Even the deaf could hear this army coming. Meanwhile, something strange is happening in the enemy camp. As the men of Judah came closer, the sound of singing confused the Moabites, Ammonites, and Maonites. They began attacking each other. Meanwhile, the army of Judah kept on marching. When they got to the high place overlooking the battlefield, all they saw were thousands and thousands of dead men. Moabites, Ammonites, Mayonites, all dead, not a one of them killed by the men of Judah. In their confusion, they had killed each other. The vast army was no more. The men of Judah never shot an arrow, never threw a spear. They didn't fight at all. They marched out singing. And by the time they got to the battlefield, it was over. Just like God said. In my Bible, the story is titled, Jehoshaphat defeats Moab and Ammon. You know what's funny about that? He didn't lift a finger. He didn't even break a sweat. No general ever had an easier battle than this. He didn't fire a single shot and he didn't lose a man. He didn't even have time to get his uniform dirty. But notice this, they worshiped God before the crisis, they worshiped during the crisis, they worshiped after the crisis. Worship is not an event. Worship is your chance for hope today. Amen. Thank you, Roy, for sharing that inspiring message. Well, that's the end of our program for today. Thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope. If you would like to learn more about us or share us with friends on Facebook or social media, please visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow at the same time. Ronnie Mills will be presenting life-changing stories. We will have a moving devotional from Breath of Life and a whole lot more. If you enjoyed our devotional thought today, please visit hope.study for your free Bible study guides.
We enjoyed our time together with you today. Can't wait to see you tomorrow, friends. Yes, we'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. And before we go, we have a Bible promise for you. Today's Bible promise says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Friends, whatever your trials and challenges may be today, whatever your struggles, remember that God is seeking to work out something wonderful in you. So take heart, be of good cheer, stay close to Jesus today. After all, He has promised to be with you through every struggle and difficulty. And what a wonder and peace to know that as we go through the struggles of today with Jesus, he is changing us. He's molding us into a beautiful masterpiece after his own image. So let's pray together that as challenges come our way today, that we will stay close to him and remember this amazing promise. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, today, Lord, as we face a new day, we know, Lord, that it's not going to be just an easy, care, um, carefree day. No, it's going to have its challenges, but Lord, we're not going to worry. We're not going to be stressed. Instead, Lord, we're going to claim the promises that you have given us. We're going to focus on you today. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through our day, even in the middle of the day, in the middle of our workplace, that there will be something that we heard today that you will bring back into our minds, back to our memories, so that we will remember the word that you just shared with us today that will carry us through this day. And we thank you for answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.